Biden's horrible plan to put politics above American security. Keeping you informed and engaged now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. So you may remember early on in the Biden administration, we actually filed a FOIA request. Hey, Biden administration, why did you remove the Houthis from the list of designated terrorist organizations by the Department of State? That was November 30th, 2023. And then, of course, do they respond? They don't respond to the FOIA. So we have to go into federal court in January, which we did. And then in the meantime, uh, the Houthis are put back on the foreign terror list. And that's because they started firing at ships going through uh, the Red Sea, and they were, again, um, uh, they were firing on U.S. ships, international ships as well. And the U.S. has now uh, said that they would consider revoking their recent designation of Yemen's Houthis as terrorists if the Iran-backed militants cease uh, their shipping attacks in and around the Red Sea. Uh, the, the I guess, the pre- President Joe Biden's special envoy for Yemen, uh, Tim uh, Leander King, I'm going to say it, maybe I said that right, Will. Uh, my, he said, my hope is that we can find diplomatic off-ramps. Now, again, the, the question is, is that all the Houthis have to do? I mean, Will, is it, is it basically, hey, stop firing at the ships going through the Red Sea. You can continue to fire at our ally, Saudi Arabia. We've got U.S. Uh, troops uh, that are about to be on the Gaza Strip to build that pier for humanitarian aid. We've got Iran upset. We'll get into that in a moment as well. And uh, yet we're, we're, we're willing to take you off the terror watch list if you just stop firing uh, missiles and rockets into uh, ships trying to cross through the Red Sea. Once again, this is the appeasement strategy of the Biden administration. We've seen it with how they treat Iran from day one, really how they've treated the Houthis since day one, because they wanted to reverse a Trump era move of putting them on the foreign terror uh, organization list that the State Department has. And you see it around the world where weakness reigns supreme within the Biden administration. And even here where they talk about diplomatic off ramps with the terror organization. Yes. Keep that in mind. They're currently listed as a terror organization for them. And they want to find a diplomatic off road off ramp with them. When, since when do we start diplomatically negotiating with terrorists? Wow. It'd be it's like after 9-11, if they went to Al Qaeda and said, hey, you know what? We have you as a designated foreign terror organization. Don't fly any more planes into American soil and bring down any more buildings, and we'll take you off that list. This is Tim Linderkin. He is the uh, envoy to Yemen. He did this press briefing on May 3rd. Take a listen. Um, But my hope is uh, the envoy for Yemen is that we can find diplomatic off-ramps to find ways to de-escalate and allow us to pull back eventually the designation and, of course, to end the military strikes on Houthis' military capability. The military strikes on their military capability. Anyways, I mean, I guess we we don't want to be in conflicts we don't have to be in, but they are a proxy of Iran. Uh, We've got Israel, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later, has taken out uh, some top Iranian generals. They're threatening to respond uh, Iran is threatening to respond while well, we've got U.S. troops in uh, Syria, Iraq, and, of course, we're going to have Sy- U.S. troops in the Gaza Strip, which is pretty wild to say. Right. And you also have to remember that as they're saying they want to find ways to de-escalate and end the military strikes, well, clearly the military strikes that they were doing weren't strong enough. They were tepid because if the Houthis haven't stopped these attacks, they weren't crippled. So now they're having to go to diplomacy right. because military option didn't work. You know, folks, your life, your liberty, it's at stake. And that's what we're focusing on our efforts on this month through our life and liberty drive. But we can't confront the immense challenges we face today without your tax deductible support. Have you have your gift doubled today at ACLJ.org. Right now we are battling the Biden administration court. One of our 18 pending lawsuits against the deep state over its dangerous decisions regarding the Houthi terrorists. Today, we're filing a critical amicus brief in the Georgia Court of Appeals. We'll talk about that. We come back to disqualify D.A. Fonnie Willis uh, from prosecuting President Trump and remove the odor of mendacity lying that is hanging over our judicial system in this case. Be part of our life and liberty campaign. That's at ACLJ.org. Double your impact today. Donate today. 
On the 19th of November, Houthi rebels from Yemen launched an attack in the Red Sea. And this was the start of a campaign against commercial vessels. Already the Houthis had aimed missiles at Israel since October the 7th. Now, using an array of weapons, including missiles and drones, they were taking aim at the Red Sea. We are more determined to continue targeting ships linked to Israel, and we will not back down from that. And our position stems from our faith. The Americans should know what that means. The Houthis say they're showing support for the Palestinians and Hamas. They're part of the so-called axis of resistance, along with Hamas and Lebanon's Hezbollah. Anti-Israel, anti-West, and backed by Iran. The Houthis' slogan is death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews, and victory to Islam. We will continue to prevent all ships of all nationalities heading to Israeli ports from navigating in the Arab and Red Seas until they bring in the food and medicine that our steadfast brothers in the Gaza Strip need. While the Houthis are pulling the trigger, so to speak, they're being handed the gun by Iran. The Houthis, this militia group, that operates in one of the poorest countries in the world that most Americans have never heard of is holding the global economy at risk. So that's a great situation for Iran because none of their assets are at risk. Iran could, could stop these kinds of things, but in the meantime, the international community is going to come together. We're going to help to safeguard international shipping that's transiting the Red Sea. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to help provide that deterrent effect in terms of presence. Iran denies this, but the Americans are acting. They've released this footage of a U.S. Navy warship intercepting a Houthi attack. The U.S. has set up a large multinational naval task force, which includes France and the U.K. And it has this message. These attacks are reckless, dangerous, and they violate international law. Back uh, to Secular. We are taking your calls to 1 800 684 3110. That's 1 800 684 3110. Rick Rednell is joining us, of course, an expert, both uh, as, again, uh, someone who's been at the State Department, um, a top diplomat uh, for the United States, ambassador to Germany, and uh, director of national intelligence. And, Rick, I wanted to go to you right on this, this Houthi uh, designation and the fact that the U.S. is putting out through our special envoy that we would yet again. This would be the second time the Biden administration removed the Houthis from the terror uh, terror list uh, that the State Department uh, keeps. They did this right away at the beginning of the Biden administration. Again, it looks like to try and play nice with Iran. And it would look like uh, that would be, again, they're, the same reason they would do it this time, is that basically they want to make nice with Iran. We've got to get the Houthis off the list. So Houthis, please stop firing uh, at the, the ships going through the Red Sea, and we'll take you off the list. You don't have to do anything else. Look, here's the problem is that the Houthis are a terrorist organization. They've been causing havoc in the entire region. But the Biden team only decided to take action uh, once they started attacking in the Red Sea. The Biden team just literally has a Red Sea focus. They're not concerned about the terrorist attacks in the rest of the region. And when they were added, when the Biden team added the Houthis, it was only because of the Red Sea attacks. Now what they're saying is, if the Houthis will pull back from Red Sea attacks, then they will remove them from the terrorist list. Really what the Biden team is saying, go do terrorism outside of the Red Sea and then it will be none of our business. And I think that's a dangerous message. Under the Trump administration, we put the Houthis on the terrorist list for all of their action, their destabilizing action in the in the region, because the Iranians were giving them money and using them to really attack Saudi Arabia. Don't forget, they've attacked the UAE under the Biden administration. This has been uh, an unbelievable uh, move by the Houthis that has been unrestrained until they went into the Red Sea. Yeah, and then we've got our own troops. I mean, we've got uh, this attack by Israel on Iranian commanders and IRGC commanders, but we've got our own troops a couple days away from the Gaza Strip where they're going to be building uh, that, uh, again, that port for humanitarian aid. We've got Iran threatening to respond and retaliate for uh, the, uh, the again, the killing of their the Iranian the, the guard commanders. So we've got the Houthis, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. We've got our troops in Syria in Iraq, and we've soon got our troops in the Gaza Strip. 
Look, there are very few issues that unite the pro-Israel community, evangelicals, and the pro-Arab communities. I mean, certainly they're united around the fact that there was no war during Donald Trump's presidency and there were peace agreements. But there's also a united front between Arabs and Israelis and pro-Israel crowd and the, the pro-Arab crowd in that Iran is the problem and that Iran didn't have money under the Trump administration. Once Biden came in and relieved the sanctions, gave the Iranian regime credit and cash to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, then we saw Iran start funding all of these terror groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Houthis. There are a whole bunch of other groups that are beginning to destabilize in Syria, which is why the Israelis now are, are acting in Syria. Uh, we've seen them destabilize Lebanon. Now there's some talk of uh, a strategy to destabilize the Kingdom of Jordan. This is really becoming a problem and it all boils down to funding Iran. No one should be surprised that when you give the Iranian regime hundreds of billions of dollars that they're going to do more terrorism. And then, what is concerning me, Rick, this port um, that we are going to build in the Gaza Strip that is supposedly for humanitarian aid, it's, it, putting our U.S. troops in, uh, again, uh, you're, you're leaving it up to Hamas to decide how to treat uh, U.S. troops. You're leaving it up to uh, these groups like the IRGC and that are that operate in the Gaza Strip. And, of course, the Israelis. I mean, there's an active war going on where there are, um, you know, com- non-combatants that get caught up in, in uh, the conflict as well. And I mean, I think for the first time in, in all these conflicts that we've seen, uh, we're going to put U.S. troops right in the middle of it. Yeah, for me, the big problem is the sequencing, um, because certainly talking about getting rid of the leadership that is atrocious in the Palestinian territories, that's not working for the people. Remember, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian leader, was elected in 2005 to a five-year term. He's now in his 18th year of his five-year term. Uh, Now we're talking about uh, just having Abbas appoint somebody and that's now the new government. I mean, this is total chaos. We're gonna need to deal with uh, the Palestinian uh, governments. We're gonna need to deal with uh, what do we do about getting rid of the bad actors and rebuilding and trying to, to move forward. All of those conversations are legitimate, but not now. The reality is we still have hostages, American hostages. And until Israel gets all of the hostages back, we shouldn't be talking about rebuilding or what comes next. We should be supporting Israel in getting our hostages back and getting the other hostages back. That is the sole focus. This is a sequencing issue. I mean, this, that is my issue, Rick, with kind of like this whole discussion, whether it's the Houthis, whether it's building this port for aid for the Gaza Strip, and while you've got uh, you know 100 plus hostages, as you said, there's still American hostages, some that are alive, some that are dead. We don't know all the details yet. And and yet we're acting like this. This is like over. And this is far from over. There are strikes going on. Uh, again, Iranian uh, top uh, leaders uh, taken out by uh, the Israelis over the weekend. Iran saying they're going to respond. I mean, this is still a very active conflict. And, to, and we don't even know, know, I guess, how far it will spread. You know, will it spread to uh, the north with Hezbollah. What, what what will what will the Houthis do? Are they, and then of course, we're saying the Houthis, hey, stop shooting on the ships going through the Red Sea. But what about uh, stop shooting at our allies in the Gulf states? Yeah, look, all these are legitimate questions, and you can't be surprised that terrorists do terror. Uh, that that's what they do, and when you fund them, that's what you get. And so what what I think that uh, we need to be able to do is be very clear as the U.S. government that we are supporting Israel and getting back the hostages, for one. And two, we're not going to deal with uh, Hamas. We're not going to have debates or negotiations with terrorist organizations. By the way, Jordan, there are a whole bunch of Arabs that support that position. They don't want to deal with Hamas whether you're talking about Turkey, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, they would like to see the region developed without Hamas. And so we need to be leaning on our Arab partners to say, work with us, get rid of these terrorists who are leading the Palestinians 
And then we can talk about rebuilding. Uh, and, and the Arabs are going to have a big role in this. But the first focus, get our American hostages and other hostages back and then get rid of the Hamas leadership that we can then have conversations with others to talk about rebuilding. Rick, obviously, there's there's a lot of complications potentially here. If we had a different administration that wasn't just dangling out, hey, if you stop doing this, we'll, put, we'll pull you back off the, the terror list like we did right when we came in as the administration, uh, which the ACLJ filed a FOIA on about why did they even do that? I mean, what was the, even the point? The Houthis were already committing acts of terror. There was no reason for them to be taken off the list. Uh, our only guess is it's because they want to deal directly with Iran and because they're an Iranian proxy, they had to take them off the terror list. But could this quickly be turned around? I mean, and quickly, I mean, I'm, to, to be fair, can we get this going in the right direction again like it was towards uh, uh, the end of the Trump administration? Look, I'm a pretty positive person. I believe that the glass is usually half full. Uh, but the one thing that I learned about being at the U.N. for eight years is that nothing can replace American leadership. When there is American leadership, a lot can get done. And our partners and others around the world want American leadership. And so uh, I think that what we've seen over the last three and a half years is a lack of US leadership, certainly from the State Department, certainly from Jake Sullivan, who's an academic, doesn't really know what he's doing in the real world. And Joe Biden, as we see, is kind of fumbling and relying on people like Blinken and Sullivan to, to lead on foreign policy, but they don't know what they're doing. And so what, what we really have is a lack of US leadership. We are in defense mode, we're responding we're not on the offense. Yeah. Uh, Rick, as always, we appreciate all of your insight. We appreciate being part of our team at the ACLJ. And, folks, Rick Rennell is part of our team at the ACLJ because of our supporters and because of people like you who take part in our life and liberty drive. Uh, right now, your gifts will be doubled today at ACLJ.org. Uh, today is a big day for us. We urgently need you uh, and your support now during our life and liberty drive. You can have your gift doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you are able... Please become an ACLJ champion. You know, we talk about ACLJ champions. We'd like to hit 21,000 champions in the next few days. Those are people that donate monthly to the ACLJ automatically. You choose the amount that you're comfortable with. We are only about 159 people short of our goal. Earlier this morning, it was 161. So you've had more champions sign on. So we encourage you again to go to ACLJ.org right now. Be part of our life and liberty drive. And again, if you can... Become an ACLJ champion. You're right at the tip of the spear. Whether it is the work we're doing in Georgia to remove uh, a DA Fani Willis, uh, the work that we're doing in the Middle East, uh, the work that we are doing for Israel, uh, the work that we are doing for life. When we come back, we'll talk about that as, as well. You've got a great new article up at ACLJ.org that exposes the corruption at the border and how our taxpayer dollars are funding it. Can you explain to folks, I want them to check out the article at ACLJ.org, which just posted on, on Friday, it's brand new, but explain to our, our, the people watching and listening to the show how that's happening. Well, thanks for thanks for asking. It's an important issue because I think everyone listening and watching needs to understand that it's their money that is now aiding these illegal migrants to come into our country. It happens through a complex web of international organizations, charities, uh, human rights organizations, but in the end is coming through grants that come from the United States Department of State. To get into the weeds a bit, the International Organization of Migration is a UN organization that says they're for humane migration, but the truth is they're providing cash payments, interest rate, interest-free loans to help migrants make the journey from South and Central America to the U.S. southern border, prepaid credit cards. This is crazy stuff. And the underwriter for that U.N. organization is the State Department, the Bureau of Population Management. So U.S. taxpayer dollars ending up in the hands of illegal migrants coming across our southern border. Uh, this is ludicrous. This is dangerous. And I hope that the American people will demand that President Biden and his administration stop using taxpayer money to fuel the illegal migration flow into our country. To make that worse is that we just don't know who's coming in. So are we funding a national security threat against ourselves? We can see that they're originating now in China and in places that are our adversarial nations. Even just a tiny fraction of that number of people are bad actors, folks who come here with, uh, with dangerous intent. Even if it's 1% or 2%, someday we will wake up and find that we have permitted, we have helped fund 
illegal migration into our country in a way that presents a terror threat and a threat to our republic. Back to Secular. We are to your calls, 2-1-800-684-3110. If you want to weigh in, that's 1-800-684-3110. And I'd love to hear from ACLJ champions. If you're an ACLJ champion out there, someone who has decided to make that monthly donation to the ACLJ, give us a call. I'll let people know why uh, you uh, decided to become an ACLJ champion. It can be a number of those issues that we talked about, and uh, we certainly talk about a lot of them today, whether it's the, the situation with the Houthis that we've talked about with Rick, whether it's a situation with Israel, whether it is the situation right here in the United States in the battle for life. As we have seen uh, since the Dobbs case and the overturning of Roe versus Wade, there's been a new uh, battle uh, for the life of the unborn. It's been happening at the state level. The ACLJ has been directly involved. We knew this battle would would begin, and we knew it would be a battle of education and a battle inside the courts. Jeff Surti is a senior counsel with the ACLJ is joining me now. And, Jeff, uh, again, this is a, a victory out of federal court in uh, K- Kentucky as well. Tell people about this one and a case that we've got uh, very soon uh, that we will be filing with the U.S. Supreme Court. That's right, Jordan. Yeah, we uh, filed suit back in 2021 against Louisville's um, abortion buffer zone law that prohibits uh pro-life speakers, including sidewalk counselors, from within getting within a certain distance of not just abortion clinics, but all health care facilities within the city. So anyway, we filed a lawsuit, and after the district court denied our motion for a preliminary injunction, we took that up to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and in short order, that court, the Court of Appeals, great opinion by Chief uh, Judge Sutton, said, no, the district court was wrong. A preliminary injunction should enter. And so our clients and others were protected uh, under the First Amendment to be able to engage in pro-life speech outside these facilities. Well, usually, Jordan, as you know, what happens in cases like this where you win a preliminary injunction at the Court of Appeals, you know, the writing is on the wall, and the other side will just go, will fold once you get back to the district court. Well, that didn't happen here. Uh, The county said, oh, okay, yeah, we lost that on appeal, but you know what? This case is moot because abortion is illegal in Kentucky. So they tried to dismiss um, our lawsuit in its entirety. We came back with a briefing, and we had an evidentiary hearing last fall where we argued that even though abortion for the time being is illegal in Kentucky, our clients are still giving a powerful pro-life witness outside the clinic that's still open, although it doesn't provide for abortions. It does uh, give referrals for abortion. Our clients still go there. They still go to the Planned Parenthood Center where they get a public pro-life witness to the message uh, and hope of life. And so this case isn't moved. They're still engaging in free speech activities on, in traditional public forums, on public sidewalks. Well, anyway, Jordan, this last weekend, we got a ruling from the district court denying the county's efforts to dismiss dismiss our case on grounds of mootness. So the case is going to move forward. Uh, There's a hearing scheduled um, in the next month or so where we are going to um, make the argument that this ordinance is unconstitutional under the First Amendment, and the county should lose, and our client should be given a permanent injunction, a permanent right to be able to speak freely about their pro-life views and to pray outside these abortion clinics. And Jeff, just to explain to people, too, we also know that the restrictions on abortions in the post-Roe world, they're also under legal challenge everywhere across the country, whether it was a legislature or it is a, a, a law that's passed by uh, that has been uh, you know, kind of an amendment that people have supported or amendments that have failed. Um, we know that there's kind of it's kind of all over the place as we speak right now, and so it's a very important time to protect pro-life speech because, as we all knew, that the day that it, that uh, Roe versus Wade was finally overturned and it came through the Dobbs case would be the day that pro-life speech would actually become the most important speech, uh, and that's because we'd be able, Jeff, to finally bring this debate outside of Washington D.C. to the kitchen table to our communities to talk about abortion, and that's what these counselors do. And, again, we've got a case in New Jersey, similar case, uh, that we are uh, t- appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court as well. 
That's right. Yeah, they're uh, in Englewood, New Jersey. We filed a lawsuit against that city for its abortion buffer zone law, which is actually very similar uh, to Louisville's. And that case had been around a long time. We've gone up and down to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals multiple times. And now the Third Circuit has said, no, this ordinance is perfectly constitutional under the First Amendment and under uh, governing Supreme Court decisions. And quite frankly, the Third Circuit got it wrong. And so at the end of the month, we're going to ask the Supreme Court to intervene in this case and to get the law, set the record straight and to correct the law um, and let the Third Circuit know and every other jurisdiction in the country know that if you're going to uh, suppress speech on public sidewalks, you have got to have a compelling reason to do so. Um, and And suppressing speech has to be the last resort of a government in trying to further its ends not the first option to take. And that's the first option that Englewood, New Jersey, took. It's the first option that Louisville took in trying to deal with activities outside their abortion clinics, to suppress speech, not to deal with conduct. Jeff, as always, we we appreciate uh, your insight into these cases and the work that we do, uh, that you do uh, for life and to protect the the pro-life speech. You know, Will, all, all these cases, too, we're fighting back to correct some wrongs that have been decades long when it comes to pro-life speech. That's right, specifically the Hill v. Colorado Supreme Court decision, which was under a more liberal court, but we believe was a wrong interpretation of the Constitution and the law. And one avenue to see that potentially overturned is through the cases like the Turco case that Jeff and you were just talking about. And we know that some deference was paid to our side within the Dobbs decision, where... uh, Justice Alito mentioned that bad law had come out of Roe v. Wade and specifically cited Hill v. Colorado. And so we're hopeful that the Supreme Court, under the makeup that we have now, will see an opportunity to undo some of that bad law by overturning Hill v. Colorado through a case like the Turco case, which we are filing cert very shortly. Yeah, I mean, this could, again, change pro-life speech uh, significantly and rewrite the history on pro-life speech, which is why we said, you know, the Dobbs case, it's just the beginning of the impact of what it meant to overturn Roe versus Wade, what it meant for the actual issue of abortion, what it meant to have the conversations again. Does it mean we're going to win in every state and in every every uh, conversation we have right away? No, but it lets us have the debate, and it doesn't force the debate to be stuck in Washington, D.C. Now, on these other bad laws that came out of Roe versus Wade, like restrictions on speech because it happened to be pro-life speech. We are taking cases, ACLJ cases, back. Uh, and again, they're relevant yet again. Uh, and we believe they can be reversed. You can actually change Supreme Court precedent when it comes to pro-life speech. So it is another very important reason to support the work of the ACLJ through our life and liberty drive, uh, which, again, it's the entire month. You can have your gift doubled today at ACLJ.org. But it's whether or not uh, you, know, you you support the ACLJ because the work we do on life, the work we do for the freedom of speech, the work we do for Israel, the work we do to combat terrorism, uh, the work that we do to disqualify a DA Fonnie Willis from prosecuting President Trump so that we don't have this odor of mendacity hanging over our judicial system. All of that work that we do with the ACLJ can be a reason why uh, you uh, support the work of the ACLJ with a financial uh, contribution. You can have your gift double to ACLJ.org. And, of course, again, we're only 159 champions away from 21,000 champions. That's a monthly automatic donor to the ACLJ, and your gift will be doubled today at ACLJ.org. The ACLJ fights the battles that matter most to our members. We listen to you, and we're taking action through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. Every dime we receive goes to defend life and liberty, from Capitol Hill to Geneva to the United Nations. Now is the time to fight. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world. 
every gift you give will be doubled dollar for dollar, doubling your impact for life and liberty. Go to ACLJ.org right now and help us. Keeping you informed and engaged now more than ever. This is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. Welcome back to Secchio. We are taking your phone calls to 1-800-684-3110. And while we've talked about a, a couple of issues today, the Houthis, our pro-life work, uh, of course, uh, our work in Georgia, as well as we filed today in the Court of Appeals in the state of Georgia. This is Donald Trump versus the state of Georgia. Here's our brief of the ACLJ that is filed. Uh, and this is uh, to have Fonnie Willis removed from the case, that we agree with the judge that it was right to remove the special counsel, but that you can't just remove uh, the special counsel, that you've got to also remove uh, Fonnie Willis as well. And, Will, we filed that today with the Georgia Court of Appeals uh, through the ACLJ. Again, very important. It just kind of shows that uh, as, all the different aspects of our work in just a, a three or four different issues we talked about today already on the broadcast. That's right. And we know that we have our offices abroad and both the European Center for Law and Justice, which you just came back from, or our office in Jerusalem. We had Jeff Balaban on the broadcast yesterday with a report from there and work all throughout the country, whether it be protecting free speech for those who want to pray or demonstrate outside of a, a, an abortion clinic. But we also have uh, work like this, where when a judge basically lays out the roadmap for the removal of the DA, and then at the end of his order says, well, she can stay on. It felt very much like the James Comey plan where he listed all the bad things Hillary Clinton had done, but said, but we're not going to charge her. That's how this felt. So when the president's lawyers appealed to the appeals court in Georgia uh, at the end of last week, that opened the door for us to file an amicus to uh, demonstrate to the court and lay out through this amicus what we see the law as here at the ACLJ. And that's exactly what we did today with the filing of this brief. Yeah. But do you want to take a call before we get to the end of the uh, segment? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go to Warren in Idaho on line one. Warren, you're on Seculo. Thanks for taking my call, guys. I wanted to comment like you'd asked about the champions and why we support ACLJ. And I kind of chuckled because, yeah, we're not Iran, but in a way we're the proxy supporting you guys. Because we can't enter those battlefields, but we can support the ACLJ as Christians and givers to have you guys take that fight on and stand for righteousness and stand for Israel, stand for our rights, and stand for Christians and, and the unborn around the world. Hey, you know what, Warren, let me uh, thank you. And again, uh, we're more than your proxy. We're standing up for you. Uh, on those battles, in those battles. And, again, I think the way you think about it is exactly right for so many of our donors uh, to think about how, why, how you're supporting our work is that you're making sure our attorneys are able to be in court, whether they are fighting those pro-life laws, whether they are fighting bad laws in Europe, bad laws, you know, saving lives in Pakistan, uh, whether they are fighting uh, to, for the uh, for Israel's a right to exist and our office in ACLJ Jerusalem, whether they're fighting at the U.N., the U.S. Supreme Court when it comes to pro-life speech, Capitol Hill with our government affairs team. I mean, you think about that. Uh, you're, you as an ACLJ champion or ACLJ donor, make sure all of that work happens. And it continues to happen. It continues to grow. It expands. We're able to add to our team. We're able to uh, take it up to a next level. And this is a great time to support the work of the ACLJ because we have a life and liberty drive. Uh, you can double the impact of your donation. And, again, we're also in court in Georgia. Like I said, I mean, I only mentioned this for a couple of minutes, but uh, this, in Donald Trump versus state of Georgia, the ACLJ has filed this brief today at the Georgia Court of Appeals to say, hey, Fonnie Willis, you need to go as well uh, to, to correct this judicial wrong. So we fight the two-tiered system of justice the whistleblowers that we support uh like garrett o'boyle and the merits brief uh to the dc court uh circuit that we filed yesterday and i think about all of this work all this work just in the last 24 hours to, to uh the court of appeals and the win there on the pro-life speech to the georgia court of appeal as in louisville uh in kentucky to the georgia uh, court of appeals on fonnie willis protecting our judicial system the same judicial system that that uh prosecute you if we can prosecute president trump this way uh fighting the the for these whistleblowers 
to be able to use the whistleblower system. It's all through the American Center for Law and Justice. Double the impact of your donation and become an ACLJ champion today. Donate today at ACLJ.org. We'll be right back with Mike Pompeo. Attack that killed a top Iranian general in Syria. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the strike, and the Pentagon says that the U.S. made it very clear to Iran that it, meaning the United States, was not involved in that strike, sending that message through private channels because tensions in the region are, quote, so high. General Zahidi was a commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force and a key figure in Iran's proxy war against Israel that provides training and weapons for terror groups in the region. Zahedi and his deputy reportedly meeting with those leaders inside the consulate, likely planning further strikes on Israel. Iran is threatening a harsh retaliation, and Hezbollah said the enemy would receive punishment and revenge. Iran's ambassador to Syria promised a swift, direct, and harsh response. This is what the Iranian foreign minister says on screen. An important message was sent to the American government as a support of the Zionist regime. America must be held accountable. They will be slapped for that, of course. Day by day, the regime will become weaker, and God willing, it will get closer to demise and destruction. Iran's President Raisi and Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah hinted the U.S. also might be targeted. America is undoubtedly an inevitable partner in the crimes of the Zionist entity in Gaza. The enemy will be defeated as well as all who stand behind this enemy. Iran may view the upcoming Al-Quds Day as a time to retaliate. On the last Friday of Ramadan, Iranians chant death to Israel and demand the end of the so-called Israeli occupation of Palestine. I think they're caught by surprise, but it's likely they're going to apply additional pressure against the United States, believing that the United States is going to be willing to apply pressure to constrain Jerusalem and so thereby achieve their ends without having to directly confront Israel. And again, Israel has provided a path for us to recognize exactly what should be done to hold the Iranians accountable. Welcome back uh, to Secchio. It's great to have Secretary Pompeo back uh, for a second day in a row with us because there is a lot happening around uh, the world at, as our senior counsel for global affairs. First question, it goes to that President Biden is now announced through his envoy that he's considering uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Pompeo revoking the terrorist label from the Houthis if they stop attacking ships in the Red Sea. Just try to help us wrap our heads around uh, the absurdity of this. We were not uh, clear why the uh, Biden administration did this when they first came into office with the Houthis and they immediately removed uh, the terror label and then they stuck it back on them when they started firing on the ships and now they're telling them, hey, if you stop firing on the ships, you don't have to do it, stop your other terrorism, but stop firing on the ships and we'll remove the designation. Well, Jordan, it's it's unexplainable to me. Uh, you said it's absurd. I think that's kind. Uh, let's be. Let's go back to the first principle. The Houthis, uh, a bunch of tribesmen in Yemen who have money and sophisticated weapon systems and training that comes from the Islamic Republic of Iran, are terrorists. They're committing terrorist acts. They have committed terrorist acts. We seldom take groups off terror lists just because they stop for a month or a year committing terrorist acts because we know they are still in their core terrorists. And so you, you have this exactly right. Uh, the Obama administration had refused to put the Houthis on the list of terrorists. We placed them on that list, and then uh, within a week or two of the B uh, Biden administration coming, they took them off. And now they're they're saying, "Hey, we'll we'll do you a favor. Um, you've already killed Americans. You've already caused Navy SEALs to have to jump in the water. You've done you fired missiles into Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. You're attacking ships. But if you stop for a little bit, well, maybe we'll de-designate you. We'll say you're not terrorists. First of all, it'd be untrue. Second, it would be dangerous because what comes along with this designation." are lots of penalties and punishments which aim which the aim of the central aim of is to deter the houthis frankly when you when you get it wrong jordan at the macro level and you don't punish iran the houthis aren't going to stop until it's in their in best interest to do so and taking their taking this label of terrorists off of them isn't going to stop them from wreaking terror on the region yeah i mean do you think the biden administration is at this point secretary pompeo because of the loss of u.s leverage like it's just they've got nothing else to try so We'll just tell them, hey, stop firing at the ships in the Red Sea, which is hurting everybody's shipping, and 
we, we will look past like you, all that terrorism that you just mentioned. I mean, firing into other countries, firing at U.S. troops, and uh, and the terrorism they're committing uh, in their own country as well. Their support, of course, from Iran. But if they'll stop doing this, uh, that's enough for the United States right now. As you said, to take away a designation which uh, is very serious because it also punishes those who support your terrorism. Exactly right. Yeah, I do think in part this is this is kind of if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. And so they have this little piece of leverage and they're hopeful that that'll maybe cause them to stop. In the end, Jordan, you, you and I know the reality. The only thing that's going to stop them is going after the head of the snake, the Iranians, and then taking out their capacity. That is going into Yemen through various means, not putting soldiers and sailors and airmen on the ground, but destroying their capacity to inflict this terror. We and our allies have the ability to do so. Those would be the two things that would really put this to bed. Uh, but sadly, they're going to take this half measure, and I'm confident uh, that it'll do almost no good. I, I'll give you another great one that's connected. Remember in Venezuela, we the Biden administration told Maduro, we'll take off a bunch of the U.S. designations and sanctions if you'll allow there to be a full and fair election. You'll let your opposition be on the ballot. We did that. We lifted those sanctions. Maduro, of course, took all those people off the ballot. And you should know, Jordan, we haven't reinstated them. He's running willy-nilly. Uh, the Houthis see that. The Iranians see that. The Russians see that. This is an administration that has lost its capacity to deter because they're unprepared to do the hard work to protect America. I want to jump to this one because we have troops that are just days away, the news is reporting, from arriving in Gaza. This is to build what has been talked about as a aid pier. Uh, for uh, Gaza to the Gaza Strip, and it, again, supposed to be humanitarian. But this also comes at the same time when you've got the IRGC, the Iranian uh, uh, Revolutionary Guards, after a strike in Syria uh, there uh, with some of their top leaders. They they are saying that they will retaliate. And you're also putting our troops kind of at the will of Hamas and their allies, like Iran, uh, to build this pier. But I mean, it just seems like things are getting more dangerous, not less dangerous, and now U.S. troops are going to be right in the middle of it. Oh, I, I think that's true. I also think it's a bit of an empty gesture that is. I, I've seen the planning, at least as reported for this pier. Boy, it is going to be a really difficult thing to make sure that this resupply that I think everyone wants innocent Gazan civilians to eat and have what they need. Sure. But to get this from uh, our pier, the U.S. built pier, to actually to get them to them, you're going to have to run through the Hamas leadership. And we've seen time and time again that is almost almost certain to fail. Uh, you're right about risk, too. Uh, the more soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines we put inside the Iranian strike zone, they're the umbrella, which they places they can reach out to, the greater the risk. And I, I hope none of us will forget two other things that are taking place that are seldom reported, one of which is since October 7th of last year, there have been over 100 strikes on American interests, American resources. And second, you still have Americans held hostage and so to think that somehow we're going to solve this problem through building a pier off the coast in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Gaza, seems both foolhardy and dangerous. Yeah, to me, it's just it's just, again, to put the troops in the, that kind of situation when you've got this active conflict going on uh, to me is is yeah foolhardy, dangerous is what you said. Uh, exactly right. Secretary Pompeo, the final kind of question for you. We we know that. President Biden has got a call with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu today. We know that the Democrats have been very outspoken, uh, calling for Netanyahu to step aside, uh, calling uh, for uh, uh, his, uh, you know, opposition to win and kind of weighing in on his Israeli elections or when there should be Israeli elections. Do you expect anything to come from uh, this call directly that will aid uh, the situation uh, right now in Israel? Jordan, sadly, I don't. I think this phone call is really about U.S. domestic politics. So Admiral Kirby or uh, Jean-Pierre can come out and say, look, the president spoke to Netanyahu and was really mean or was really angry or whatever it is, is the word of the day at the White House, where the United States is applying pressure to our ally and allies and friends, but doing almost nothing to put pressure on the Iranian regime that is, in the end of the day, the terrorists that are holding Americans hostage, even as we sit here. So I, I don't expect much other than a press release from the White House saying, hey, we talked to Prime Minister Netanyahu and we told him to, I don't know, uh, be better, to do to do things more efficiently. In the end, the Israelis are going to do the right thing. They're going to go take down the infrastructure of Hamas. That is good for them. It is good for the Gulf Arab states, and it's great for America as well. Secretary Pompeo, as always, we appreciate having you as part of our team and a senior counsel 
for global affairs at the American Center for Law and Justice. And Will, you know, it's a, when we're talking about a a, a a life and liberty drive in our campaign here, doubling the impact of people's donations. Uh, Secretary Pompeo is a perfect example of those individuals we're able to bring on to the ACLJ team because of people's financial support. And today they make that donation. It's doubled. Exactly. And when you think about the ACLJ, there's so many facets to what we do and the work we do, whether it be fighting for free speech and trying to protect the free speech of pro-life advocates or whether it be uh, protecting uh, pregnancy resource centers across the country when state laws try to go after them to try to say that they're a fraudulent business because they're not an abortion clinic, which is one of the most absurd things that happens in this country, or whether it be bringing you this broadcast every day, five days a week, free of charge, not behind a paywall, and we put it on as many platforms as we can to try to get the analysis that comes from experts or from our legal team or from uh, Logan, who's on with you most days, talking about the the ins and outs of the media world as well. It all boils down to that we work here for the supporters. We, we take the goal in mind is to continue the furtherance of our work, whether it be in the legal realm or through the media, of getting out the constitutional values that we hold so dear and that this country was founded on and that are in such jeopardy as we look forward with the ways that this administration is attacking the rights of everyday Americans. Yeah. I mean, we fight it in court, folks. We fight the policy. Uh, we've got the people like Secretary Pompeo and Rick Riddell to fight the policy. We fight in court. You've heard from our attorneys uh, today uh, going all, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but also at the Georgia Court of Appeals. Uh, to take out Fannie Willis as DA because of, uh, again, to protect our judicial system. We're filing there uh, today. Uh, we just filed yesterday in the O'Boyle case, uh, again, uh, representing that whistleblower and making sure that those whistleblower protections mean something in the United States of America. This is all work done by the American Center for Law and Justice, the work that uh, Rick Rinell does on behalf of the ACLJ, the work that Mike Pompeo does on behalf of the American Center for Law and Justice, uh, the legal work our attorneys do, our government affairs team, our media team, as Will said, is one of our executive producers of our broadcast team does as well to keep you updated on all of these issues. Again, it relies on our donors, our supporters, and this is a great time to become a donor to the American Center for Law and Justice. That's, it's a really critical time. Uh, we need your support, folks, at the ACLJ. Uh, we need those donors. Uh, you can double the impact of your donation right now at ACLJ. Uh, dot org, and we are trying to get to 21,000 ACLJ champions. And uh, we know we've added four or five more of those uh, today. And those are people who donate monthly. So they pick a number that automatically uh, donates each month to the ACLJ. And during these matching months, that means you get to take part in the matching challenge so that doubles your impact. I want you to donate today at ACLJ.org. Be a part of every one of these battles for life and liberty. We'll be right back. Democrats are nervous in Washington, D.C. I, mean, I hate talking politics when it involves human life at stake, but but we have to. Uh, that the Israel-Hamas war could actually cost them in November if they don't up their anti-Israel rhetoric. So we saw more anti-Israel rhetoric, rhetoric come out from President Joe Biden the same day that Karine Jean-Pierre put out pretty pro-Israel rhetoric from uh, the White House press podium. And, I mean, if you if you play both uh, you know, back-to-back, -back, you'd be thinking this isn't the same White House or same communications team. But So they're tr still trying to, like, play both sides. Uh, but ultimately, what we it's obvious they are concerned that, that a significant part of their base is very anti-Israel, and they're going to continue to push uh, this, uh, this at least aggressive rhetoric. We have heavy Muslim, very anti-Semitic, very anti-Israel populations that they want to have vote for them, that those populations are making a lot of noise and yelling about how Biden is, quote, too pro-Israel, even though he's far from it. And so the fact that the media treats these domestic concerns as as though it's natural that a political party, that the president of the United States would actually sacrifice the very existence, because that's what this is. This is an existential threat to the state of Israel. This is global anti-Semitism against the Jewish people, that the president is chiming in and inciting that violence and inciting that hatred and inciting these, essentially, you know, there's a term blood libel, as you know, which is created about 
for, for centuries where they would make up stories about Jews that would incite people to kill Jews. That's what's going on now. They're making up stories. The president should be saying, we know that Israel always tries to minimize civilian or non-combatant casualties better than any country in the world. But he's not. Instead, he's saying he's outraged. It's Jordan. It's actually terrifying. All right, welcome back. Final segment of Secular. We are taking your calls, too, and uh, your comments. We've got a mic in New Jersey online, too. Hey, Mike, welcome to Secular. You're on the air. Well, uh, hi. I, I completely agree with um, uh, Secretary of Pompeo. Um, Hamas is, 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 is demonically crazy, and um, we, we, we are no one to, to tell another government how to conduct a war when, when, when we, like, extremely screwed up. Um, an attack of 19 people who all killed themselves. Well, I think, listen, I think we've had a situation in Israel where the U.S. and the Biden administration, uh, they started off, Will, very supportive of Israel as we thought they would be, but we said once the war went on and once there were more deaths and once it wasn't so pretty anymore and you've got, uh, again, things that go wrong, um, that they would start condemning Israel and now uh, they're calling for, they're, they're not voting against ceasefires. They are abstaining votes uh, instead of voting against ceasefire calls, even when those ceasefires uh, at the United Nations don't call for any condemnation of Hamas. And we saw the Biden administration do that this week. We see them uh, willing to take the Houthis off the terror list because they are trying to placate Iran. I think that the Biden administration is more concerned with the political reality of their uh, election in November than they are with the fact that there are still Americans that are being held hostage by Hamas. Yeah. And you can see that by them trying to play both sides in this, by doing things that are beneficial for Hamas, such as not vetoing the UN Security Council uh, resolution last week. or But then you also see Karine Jean-Pierre, like you talked about yesterday, where she was going after Hamas, saying that they utilize hospitals and how how quickly they can rebuild. So they're trying to play it both ways. But I think it comes down to the fact is what something that was reported in The Hill yesterday, that Democrats are seeing this increasingly as a November issue for them, where they're not going to be able to get some of these coalitions that they normally rely on to win certain states because those coalitions are either mad at them for their support of Israel or if we're not being tough enough on Hamas. Yeah. And so they're fracturing their own party. And there was even an anonymous uh, House of Representatives member that was a Democrat quoted in the Hill that said, I'm worried about what Chicago is going to look like. And that is a reference to the DNC, their convention in Chicago when they formally nominate Joe Biden as their party representative. Yeah. They still go through those formalities, even though he's the incumbent. And what are we going to see? Are we going to see protests from the convention floor from delegates that are upset Hamas. because they're pro Hamas? Are they going to be wearing uh, kefias on the floor of the convention? I mean, Is what it a time, what a time? Think about the time to come out in your support for uh, uh, not just Palestinians, but your support for Hamas after the atrocities that they committed on October 7th. And we said so quickly how quickly the world would forget those atrocities on October 7th that happened to Jews in Israel um, when Israel struck back and that they would then con- you know, condemn the U- U.S. for even supporting Israel. Um, but I do want to go, I want to take uh, uh, this comment that came in, Taryn, on YouTube. She wrote, I became a champion because I believe the ACLJ is an honest organization fighting for all of us when we can't uh, legally uh, engage in the fight, and, and most of us can't. And, you know, uh, Will, I think that, you know, that a perfect example is filing in Georgia today in the Fonnie Willis cases. We're able to do that as the American Center for Law and Justice, representing our, our, our the individuals who support the work of the ACLJ and saying she should be taken off that case involving President Trump uh, because it is uh, disruptive and wrong. Uh, and it makes our judicial system look bad. Just that case alone, uh, the, the, the case we filed for Garrett O'Boyle and the whistleblower protections. Uh, these are for every American out there, for every ACLJ supporter. And and when you think about the, the Fonnie Willis case, for example, on its face, if you hear, oh, they're filing in this that deals with a, a district attorney in Georgia, why does that really matter for me as the ACLJ supporter? Well, 
it's so much beyond just uh, one proceeding in Georgia. It really goes to the heart of protecting the integrity of the foundations that this country was founded on, the judicial system. We have been proud of the U.S. judicial system throughout its history because it was breaking away from all of the negative things like star chambers in England and in things where there wasn't uh, the ability to be represented without the uh, the already the assumption that you're guilty or being able to put up a defense for yourself. All these things matter, and they've mattered for the entire history of the United States. So when you start seeing things like an odor of mendacity, which is an odor of lies in a case, and then all of a sudden it's just going to be able to continue on, we don't think that's the appropriate way. And so we're going to find creative ways as a legal organization to get involved because we want to protect the integrity of of everyone's right to live in America and not have a biased judicial system against them. And we've got an uphill battle. And that's why we need the support of ACLJ members and champions. It is. I mean, you think about the fact that you've got uh, these protests going on. And, yes, it starts at, you know, the liberal college campus. And then it goes into your city. And then they're worried that, you know, the Democrat convention become a gra- could become a ground for major protests in support, not just of Palestinians, but um, against Jews. Because we've seen the anti-Semitism that's been part of these protests. And actually support for Hamas. And support for what Hamas did on October 7th and the tactics and the terrorism and the fact that people have already forgotten how soon they forget uh, what Hamas did to children, pregnant women, the elderly, uh, uh, kids, young people who were taken. Uh, so, yes, we talk about the hostages, some alive, some dead. Uh, we forget about all of those who were killed brutally on October 7th. The over 1,000 Jews killed in one day, uh, the, the uh, most Jews in one day since the Holocaust. There's not been that many Jews killed, and, and it's certainly not that uh, that brutally. On film, in the style of like ISIS on, on, on speed, I mean, really, that extreme level uh, to target children that way, uh, to target women that way, to target pregnant women uh, that way. Uh, but yet that is what we saw, and yet there's been a protest movement not against what we saw happen on October 7th, but a protest movement uh, against responding to those attackers. And we predicted it right on this broadcast. I remember I was out on the West Coast. I said, this this will last for about a week. You know, uh, Israel will get a lot of uh, world support. People will condemn these horrible attacks because that's what's on TV. And as Israel... Uh, puts together its military and puts together its defense and decides when to strike and they're going to strike hard and they won't stop until they they feel like they have gotten the job that they want done done which is to destroy Hamas uh, that quickly the world will turn on Israel and we've seen it at the UN we've seen our own country the United States go from voting against anti-Israel resolutions including the Biden administration to now just just abstaining just one vote away from voting against Israel. So it, even that has shifted. We see the Biden administration condemn Israeli leaders and condemn uh, the Israeli response. And, and that is just, again, one aspect of what we do, one facet of what we do at the American Center for Law and Justice, of course, is the ACLJ uh, Jerusalem. We want you to support our work, be part of our life and liberty uh, challenge. It is critical uh, that we, we need your financial support. We're very clear these months. It's very important for the ACLJ. It's how we do the work that we do. It's because of our donors. And these months, uh, if you become an ACLJ champion, that's someone who picks an amount like $50 and says, I can donate that each month. Well, this month, you'll actually get to take advantage of doubling that impact. So it'll be like $100 to the ACLJ. We are only 155 people away.